Hi. Um, so this is a, a measured response to a grain of rice. Um, I'm Joe Fitzpatrick. Um, you can find me on Twitter at securelyfitz. Um, this is my first time to Black Hat Europe, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I've been to the Black Hat in the United States a few times, but that's very close to home for me. So I was glad to make it out here. Um, I have about 15 years of experience playing with hardware. Um, that includes starting out doing silicon debug. I was doing a speed debug of desktop and server CPUs. Um, from that, I moved more into um, hardware pen testing, pre and post silicon uh, of, of chips. Um, and while I was doing that, I moved into the training side. I, there were a lot of people who had a lot of background in hardware and functional validation, making, th things, making sure things worked the way they were supposed to. Um, and I kind of tried to help people understand how to pick out the hardware security bugs that they should be you know, flagging as well, um, instead of just looking at things from a purely functional perspective. Um, I do own a pair of shoes that have LEDs inside of them and a shirt that is sound sensitive and has LEDs inside too. And yes, that's at a conference. I was at work when I took that picture. Um, I now, uh, for the past six years, have been doing training. Um, I teach classes. Um, I've taught at Black Hat uh, US several times. Uh, applied physical tax training on embedded systems, x86 systems. These are all about using your hands to hook wires up and undermine the security of systems uh, by using physical access. Um, so. Before we go any further, I do want to put some disclaimers in here. Um, I think this image summarizes it pretty well. I don't know about, sh about hardware implants, but I got a buddy named Joe who does, so let's give him a call. I don't know if you know the meme, but this is uh, from a TV show that I've never actually seen uh, uh, about pawn shops, and this guy you know, at a pawn shop uh, often has people he calls. So it seems like I'm the guy who people are calling about hardware implants, since for some reason, in the past two months, people are a little more interested in them, in them than they were before. Um, I've played a lot with hardware implants over the past several years, but I'm Joe. I do this for fun, essentially. Um, I do this uh, solo by myself. I don't work for a government agency. Um, I know that there are a lot of people out there who do do this professionally, whose jobs are to build these hardware implants that might go in uh, servers or telecom systems or anything else. But I don't think you're going to get any of them to come and talk to you at Black Hat. So unfortunately, I'm just Joe. I'm what you get. So you know, know that what I'm talking about is from my own experience building things and creating things, and uh, not necessarily from the perspective of someone who is funded with uh, several millions of dollars and has signed their life away uh, on all sorts of uh, government forms and whatnot. So what is a hardware implant? Um, I'm using this word. Uh, perhaps some people aren't sure what I mean by that. The first time we, we see this word, this term of implant used a lot is around 2013. It was used a lot in uh, all the leaked documents from Snowden. Covert implants, software implants, um, network implants, these are essentially malicious bits of stuff, payloads, code, whatever, um, that is used to generally do surveillance type operations. Right? So these are intelligence agencies who want to get an implant into a server so they can monitor what's on that, so they can have a way of collecting intelligence off of this device. Um, hardware implant came into uh, more common use uh, around 2013, at the end of the year, when Der Spiegel published an article about the Ant catalog. This was a purported uh, leaked document that had several pages that described um, little malicious hardware devices that could be implanted into servers, into uh, mobile devices, um, into cables that would give hardware access to those systems. So historically, when we think of hardware implants, we think of hardware attack devices. The basic classical example is a keystroke logger. This is a USB keystroke logger. You plug it into your USB port. You plug, the, or you plug it into someone else's USB port. Um, I would never do that, but apparently that's what people do. You plug it in someone else's keyboard and their USB port, and it logs all the keystrokes that go through. You retrieve it, and then you can retrieve all the keystrokes that were, sto were stored on it. They even made these so old that they came in like PS2 connectors and, and five pin DIN connectors before we even had USB. Uh, but that's been around for, for decades at this point. Um, the other thing that's been around is mod chips. Who's ever played on a game console before? Who's ever played like a game on a game console before? Okay, um, so apparently, you know, once you once you modify and solder things onto your game console, you can still play games with it too. I don't know. That's the fun part is the soldering these mod chips on. They basically change the way the device works so that you can do things the manufacturer of the hardware didn't intend. This is a hardware modification. You know, 
the model is a little different because the attacker is now the owner of the system as opposed to the attacker being uh, not the owner and the, the, the malicious agent on the system. But uh, we get the same types of devices, the same examples of what we're looking at. We also have uh, counterfeit bypass devices. This is a photo that someone posted on Reddit a few years ago saying, hey, I bought a bunch of uh, switches on eBay or some other strange source of, of equipment. And I found one that I took apart, and it had this weird chip stuck on the bottom. Uh, anybody know what this might be? And you look at it, and of course, the reaction to post-2013 is like, oh my gosh, it's implanted. You know, you have spyware on your system. But no, this is just a, bi a counterfeit bypass device. You buy a switch, you pay for the number of ports you have on it and or the speed or configuration of it. If you want to be malicious and make money, what do you do? You take a bunch of the cheap switches, you put a bypass device on it so that suddenly they work as the expensive switches. You change the sticker on the front, you sell them to people who are willing to buy stuff on eBay, and you profit, right? Um, again, we still don't have uh, hardware implants that are being manufactured and used by intelligence agencies. So this is a project that I work on with a friend of mine, Rootkiller, uh, uh, aka Mike, um, and we made the Doobie key. So on the left, which way is left? On the right, you have an actual YubiKey. key, and I got a free YubiKey key at a conference, and I thought, oh, this is great. I wonder if it's real. How do I go verify that it's real? I go to YubiKey's website, Yubico's website. They say, oh, does it have a serial number? Like, uh, does it say powered by Yubico on the back? Then it's real. I go, okay, I, I can fake that. So we made our fake Doobie keys, were the ones on the left, um, and you can see that the case on the Doobie key is not as good as the case on the YubiKey yet, but we're still working on that. It also has a programming part of the board which hasn't been snapped off yet. But we made these devices to show, like, yeah, we, we get these hardware security devices, and we don't really have a good understanding of what hardware security means, because, again, there are a lot of people who receive those, those free YubiKeys keys at a conference, off of, out of a bowl, at a table, and don't have any re reason to believe they should be suspicious of the supply chain that got them to them. Another example from last year, or two years ago, is this, the RSA token. Um, so, you know, you have an RSA token, if you flip it over, you'd see a little display with a six-digit pin that you type in when you log in. Um, I flipped it over, took the back off, and I soldered on that little extra board, which has a Bluetooth module, right? So you take an off-the-shelf hardware device, you open it up, you add some extra parts to it, and suddenly it's Bluetooth enabled, which is like what everybody wants, right? So it broadcasts those six digit, every 60 seconds it broadcasts your six digit pin so everybody can listen to it. Or you can pair it with your computer and it types it in for you, which, you know, whatever. Um, and then even further along, we've got these uh, lots of examples of skimmers. So um, these are a series of skimmers that were found in gas pumps uh, in Colorado. Um, SparkFun is a supplier of like hobby electronics type stuff, um, and they were asked to go and take a look at some of these. And these are basically really cheap off-the-shelf devices. You can buy them for roughly $5. You can actually buy them assembled as skimmers for $5 pre-programmed. And what would happen is someone would get one of these, or they would be given one of these and say, hey, go, go plug it in that gas pump, you know, open this service panel and plug it in the socket. And then all you have to do is go back every couple days, pull out your phone, pair with it over Bluetooth, and it downloads all the credit cards that have been scanned at that gas pump, right? These are all methods of manipulating hardware devices using other hardware, right? That really, for the most part, doesn't leave a software trace, right? We think about everything we do, uh, everything we have uh, systems of logging and detection for, we're always counting on software to leave a trace or network access to leave a trace. So these are ways to avoid that. So let's talk specifically about USB hardware attacks. So USB is kind of the easy one. Everybody's heard about how, oh, don't, don't plug in a random USB drive. You don't know what it is. Well, how did we get to this point, and why do we still do it anyway? I mentioned before we've got these keystroke loggers. You know, you plug it in the USB port, you get all your keystrokes that come through, you retrieve it, and you get the, uh, can get those uh, keys later. So there's also specifically programmed devices. They're designed to be malicious USB devices. We've got in the middle the USB rubber ducky, which focuses on a lot of keyboard type attacks. You plug it in, it plays back a series of keystrokes that will open up terminals and type commands. Um, on the left, you've got the bash bunny, which is similar, except it shows up as a USB network device and a, does a few network-based attacks. Again, these are hardware devices you can buy for uh, pretty reasonable prices. You can carry them to a computer, you plug them in, and uh, have a surprisingly high level of success at uh, exploiting systems with these. 
But again, these are, these are purpose-built devices. They're designed specifically to be attack devices. Um, if you're around tomorrow, tomorrow morning, uh, Luca is going to be showing off the, uh, the WHID injector. Um, this is essentially a USB, uh, what's it called? Um, rubber ducky. It does HID and other attacks. Um, but it's uh, connected to uh, uh, Wi-Fi. I believe there's also a, a GSM version. So you can remotely do these, these, Bluetooth, uh, these USB attacks once you've plugged this device into your system. Right? We're talking about ways that we're expanding the hardware ability to access uh, and uh, proxy physical access to systems. Bad USB was pretty interesting. Um, basically, there's this chipset, the Fission chipset. You find it on USB drives. And it's a chipset. It's a SOC, a system on chip. It's got a core that's programmable. It stores flash. Um, and it gives you access to the, the NAND flash, the big volume of flash on the other side that implements a USB drive. You can reprogram this. Sometimes these are sold off the shelf without the, 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 the reprogramming uh, ability being taken away. So sure enough, you can take an existing device off the shelf, modify it with just software, and now you have a malicious hardware device that isn't even a fabricated device. It's a tampered, modified existing device. USB is even more exciting from the attacker's perspective, right? Um, you've got this port that, instead of just being USB, it also carries your display. It also carries Thunderbolt 3. Um, it can carry all sorts of different alternate data streams over it as well. Um, this is two examples of USB-C to display adapters. The one on the left is the Apple one, which costs about 80 US dollars. Um, you plug it in to your USB-C port. On the other side, you have an HDMI port, a power port, and a USB output, right? Um, but if you look at it, you've got a lot of chips on there. And I believe on the opposite side from that, uh, that picture, you've got a JTAG header for the chipset that is on there. JTAG being a debug port, you can go and reprogram the firmware. Luckily, the latest firmwares lock out JTAG access. So you may not have to worry about that unless someone goes and resolders the replacement chip on there without JTAG dis enabled. Uh, sorry, disabled. Details. On the right, you have an inexpensive $20 uh, USB, uh, USB-C to VGA adapter. And you see three chips on that little board. And I don't know if I can highlight them well enough, but you've got the biggest chip is basically what turns the display port signals off of the USB uh, into VGA signals. So it's kind of a passive analog chip. Then over here, you've got a very tiny chip. That's a USB power delivery chip. That's telling the system to give it power. It says, oh, I'd like 5 volts at, three, uh, at 500 milliamps. Or it could say, I'd like 20 volts at 3 amps, um, all software. And then lastly is this chip right here, the, the middle-sized middle chip in the corner. And that's a USB microcontroller. Um, I opened this device up thinking I would have to find a pin to short out to reprogram this microcontroller. Sure enough, it turns out it was by default reprogrammable. All I had to do was plug this into a USB port, and I could go ahead and rewrite the firmware on the USB side of my display adapter. So I chose to program it to also show up as a USB HID device. So I plug it in, the screen shows up, and suddenly random keystrokes start getting entered while I'm presenting, and slides flip around. Pretty annoying, but it's one of those things you can't do, you can't tell just by looking at this device what's inside. So even further along, you know, we have these devices that we, we previously thought were passive, like output-only devices. We've got the point where we have lightning cables that have enough extra space in the housings that you can put a malicious uh, USB device inside of them. A friend of mine, MG, um, has uh, a series of videos on his, uh, on his uh, Twitter account where he uh, basically, in the little housing of this cable, is able to put just enough logic to play back uh, a, USB series, a series of USB interactions. Um, so you don't even realize you're just using a cable, and this cable can be malicious. And this is all like kind of the high point of this that I've encountered is this cable. This is a $7 cable that I bought from China. And you look at it, and there's a MediaTek ARM CPU right here. And the reason is because this USB cable inside that housing, which is no bigger than a normal USB cable, has a cell phone module. It has a slot for a SIM card, right? And it has a microphone, right? So all the previous USB attacks were focused on interacting with the system. This one doesn't even bother. This is completely decoupled. It just gets power from the system. So you hand someone a USB cable and say, oh, here, use this to charge your phone. And they plug it in and they're charging their phone or they leave it in their car and use it to charge their phone or listen to, to music on their phone. And the whole time it's powered on, it's on the cell phone network, it's reporting its location, and when you call the device, you can open up a hot mic and listen to what's going on, right? Uh, a theory that I have not yet you know, proven is the fact that when you plug this thing into your laptop, 
it's close enough to your laptop that you would hear the tap of keystrokes, right? Timing analysis would be able to let you use this cable to figure out what keys are being pressed without even electrically, uh, sorry, logically being coupled to your PC. So it's pretty amazing to me what is possible with just USB, right? And we're only scratching the surface here. So how else could we connect a hardware implant? So let's say we, we want to make a malicious device. We can hook it up to USB or external ports. That's the easiest way, but they're kind of obvious because you see a little, little thing sticking out of a port on a PC. So you, you don't want to do that if you're trying to be uh, covert in any way. Inside the system, we've got PCI Express. Um, how many of you have extra slots that you're not using in a, in a desktop system? Probably most of you. You've also got, uh, on laptops, most Wi-Fi modules are removable. Lots of SSDs are now removable. Those are PCI Express attached devices. So even in a laptop, you've got spots where you can plug in extra hardware. What's also really neat is you can tap interchip communication. On a regular system, you've got tons of devices that are all communicating to each other, and every single one of them has a protocol they speak. If you're able to access the wires that connect two chips, you have no reason, there's no reason why you couldn't sniff that protocol. There's no reason why with a little more uh, uh, modification to the system, you couldn't intercept and man in the middle of that protocol. And lastly, you've got debug headers, right? When boards are manufactured, they're manufactured and tested. Um, they go through a qualification process. And then finally, someone says, this, this board is done. Let's manufacture it for production. And no one's going to go and do another revision of the board and remove all those debug headers because that's extra risk. You don't have the ability to go back and debug stuff that went wrong. So you often have debug headers on the board. If you could just tap onto those debug headers and pins with a malicious device, um, you could go back and play a series of debug commands to modify that system uh, in, in operation. So when we can talk about hardware, we've got, we've got entry points. We need these entry points to get into the system. But how many do we have? So this is uh, what we might see inside of a server. This uh, photo is, uh, diagram is from AST. Uh, this, they, are they are manufacturers of uh, BMC, board management controllers. And on the left side, we see the board management controller. On the right side, we see the, the, the classic CPU, Northbridge, Southbridge setup. And these days, it's kind of all in one Northbridge, Southbridge, but don't worry about that. We see we've got um, network connectivity, RMI, RGMII, right? Those are connectivities between the chip and the physical layer of the network. We've got USB 2, 2.0, 1.1. We've got PCI Express connectivity, LPC, which is a low-speed uh, version, uh, a low-pin count version of an ISA bus. We've got UART. We've got SD card slots. We've got additional NIC connections, as well as display and uh, serial ports. So we've got tons of opportunities to hook up wires to this system to uh, basically maliciously modify its operation. So when do these hardware attacks make sense? Oh, I've got to speed up quite a bit. Um, so what if you have airtight security practices? You have employees who are invulnerable to like any of those like phishing attacks or social engineering attacks. You have perfect network security, then hardware makes sense. If you're dealing with air gap systems, systems that are not on a network, that are not couplable in any way, then it makes sense to have a piece, a device that is what is your link between this and the outside world. Sometimes you actually do a decent job. You have a heavily monitored network for various reasons. Um, sometimes you have uh, industrial control type scenarios where you have these data diodes that are very careful about letting data only flow in certain directions. Um, sometimes you just have a very rigid policy that doesn't let outside access happen. Um, so again, physical access is a way to get into these systems that wouldn't be uh, otherwise remotely accessible. And of course, supply chain. If you have access to the supply chain, if you have access to how the hardware gets into the, the target system, then you have access to, that, uh, to the firmware that's on that hardware, the extra components, where those components come from. And supply chain isn't just a one-stop thing. This is the supply chain of your boards, the supply chain of your chips, the supply chain of your passive components. The supply chain includes how these devices are shipped around and how they're assembled, where they're assembled. Um, once you've manufactured a board with all its components on it, and you ship it to the end, end user, where does it go? Is it sit in a warehouse until it's deployed? Um, when we go to the situation with voting machines, right, uh, there's a lot of talk about how voting machines are so secure because they're only used on a certain day of the year, and the rest of the year they're stored in a closet in the school where the voting happens, at least in the United States. I'm sure, it's very different here. Um, but again, perhaps it's different here. Um, but again, you know, the, it, no one thinks about the security, the physical security of these devices because it's a box. It's a, it's a piece of hardware that they kind of think of as immutable. 
When it comes to a hardware attack, if you are able to implant a hardware device, right? There's no network logs, there's no traffic, there's no uh, backwards uh, uh, observation that can happen. Perhaps you've got surveillance cameras. That's kind of a different story. But there is this deniability that comes with a hardware uh, device, especially if it's an off-the-shelf type hardware device.、Um, and last, exfiltration. If you're on a network where you're very careful about what data gets out, are you also careful about what hardware leaves and how it leaves? Um, I heard a story. It is just a story. It is a multi-hand story, so I don't know how factual it is. But you've got memory modules, and memory modules have a very tiny piece of flash on them that let you program the parameters of that memory module. And there was a report where a system had memory modules that kept failing tests, and so the memory module was packaged up and sent out to RMA. And in that process, someone was caught trying to steal these memory modules from the mailroom. Turns out. Apparently, legend story. There was data on these、uh, on these little SPD、uh, flash modules on the memory modules that was exfiltrating data. So, hardware access gives you an interesting way to get data off of a system. Lastly, if we've got vulnerable hardware, if we have a bug in a piece of silicon, it's pretty tough to fix that. It definitely doesn't get fixed in a, a quick way, and generally, you don't want to destroy your hardware just because it has one bug. Um, what that means, though, is we might have a situation where our hardware vulnerabilities are baked in and known to be good for several years, whether it's five years or 30 years. If we've got vulnerable hardware that's always going to stay vulnerable, we don't have to worry about a patch or a software update that fixes it. Then we've got、uh, an easy way in. Like I said, unpatchable vulnerabilities fall in that as well. What's also interesting when we go to the lower layers of hardware, the, the deeper we bury ourselves into the hardware, the harder it is to detect. Right? It's just like in software realm. If we have a malicious process, the operating system can observe that. If we start tampering at the operating itself, operating system itself, we can't trust the operating system to report on itself. When we have a higher uh, uh, privilege levels or lower privilege levels, depending on which perspective you're looking at,、um, you may have the ability to、uh, hide from the operating system at even, an even lower level.、Um, when we get down to hardware, it's the same way. We have lower levels of hardware that are pretty much invisible to the upper layers because of the way the abstraction works. And of course, social engineering with hardware is so much more effective than just talking on the phone. Because, I mean, free Yubi keys. Who doesn't want a free Yubi key, right? So again, like, let's put it back in context. Why is any of this relevant? Why am I up here talking about these things? So,、um, what does a hardware advanced persistent threat look like, right? Examples we gave were kind of a you know more homebrewy、uh, little、uh, de more decoupled from the system. But what if what if someone had millions of dollars to go invest in creating the ideal hardware implant? What would that be? So there's a story,、uh, the big hack, and as you can see, there's a, a tiny little chip on the tip of a finger.、Um, and this story、uh, news article、uh, reported how allegedly there was this tiny little chip the size of a grain of rice. That did some really bad things, and it was implanted in the entire supply chain. And 30, ven- 30 companies had fa- found, or may have、uh, allegedly been on the list to get this malicious implant, right? And again,、uh, this device, size of、uh, the point of a pencil,、um, supposedly did all this stuff.、Um, and if we look through the article, we see the technical details, which are very limited. Something happened at a crucial moment. Small bits of the operating system. We're being stored in the board temporary memory en route to the server central processor, the CPU. The implant was placed on the board in a way that it allowed it to effectively edit this information queue, injecting its own code or altering the order of the instructions the CPU was meant to follow. From a technical perspective, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but if you put it through the journalism filter and like realize it's written for lay people, we basically have a description of. Malicious code, right? Or manipulating existing code, or maybe you could call、uh, return-oriented programming kind of the same way because you're messing with the information queue. I don't know. The point is, we've got a piece of hardware that allegedly causes some issues in the way the software runs everything, and this is a bad. This is a big deal.、Um, if we look at the、uh, example that was shown in the article, we see that they're talking a lot about supermicro motherboards. There's a photo of a supermicro motherboard. And targeting specifically the board management controller, 
when you have a server, you've got your, your x86 CPU that's doing the big tasks and all the big work, connected to lots of memory and network cards. But you've also got this backside, this baseboard management controller, this extra chip, usually an ARM processor, that helps you power up and power down the system and gives you a virtual terminal so that you can remotely administer this thing without having to walk down the aisles of, of servers to get to the one server you actually want to talk to. So number one is that chip, the A-speed CPU uh, system on chip. It's got an ARM core as well as all that connectivity we saw in a block diagram a couple slides back. Um, on the far left, we have a flash chip, um, number two. This is a, uh, I believe this flash chip is connected to the A-speed controller. It has all the firmware that this controller is actually going to run and execute. Right? Down below on the bottom left is number three. There's an additional flash chip. That's the, that's the BIOS for the CPU. So when the processor boots up, it needs its own, its own UEFI BIOS, whatever it uses. That's executing off of that chip over there. So we have two chips sitting right here in this like two square inches of board space that co hold code, that hold firmware. We look up in between the, the, C, the, the flash chip and, this, and the, the board management controller, we see number four, a little bit hard to see. Um, and that is a, a spot where there's like eight little pads of, of metal, but there's no chip there. It's a little white outline as well. It's marked UM8. That's a spot where you can actually put another flash chip. And some of these board management controllers support failover. So if one flash chip seems corrupted, it'll go reach from the other. Sometimes you see this when you have a board that just, depending on which was cheaper that day, they'll either use the 8 or the 16-pin version of that chip. So we've got an extra spot there. And in the Bloomberg article, they had an illustration where that's where they put this grain of rice-sized device. And then number five, I circled uh, just above the, uh, the board management controller. We see a whole bunch of those little, little golden dots. Those are test points. And whenever I'm dealing with a CPU, like if I were developing a system with a CPU, I would want accessibility to its debug features. So my assumption when I see golden dots right next to a CPU, I probably have a debug port of some sort. right? So a little sleuthing, you might be able to figure out what those pins are, what they do. Um, a little bit of data sheet uh, research, uh, you'll find details like that. Again, we are just talking about two square inches of this board. It happens to be a very uh, uh, capable two square inches. But this is what we can see and what we can try and do uh, within that little area. So based on this article, there was a lot of reaction of people who are panicking because we have these little devices that are the size of a grain of rice somewhere in everyone's systems or no one's systems. We're not really sure. How do we test for them? What, are there, what, do we, what do we have? What's our indicator of compromise? How do we know that we've been affected by this issue? So open up your case and look inside. Do you have grain of rice size components on your motherboard? Yes, you do. OK, here's the dilemma, though. That's how they're made, right? Um, actually, the, we have little uh, flash chips in the background on this slide. But uh, your board is covered with resistors and capacitors that are all the size of a grain of rice. This is how we assemble these boards. This is how we get so much complexity into such a small space. So will you see these components? Yes. Are they necessarily malicious components? Probably not. Now, do your boards exactly match the best schematics you can get of them? So this is assuming you can actually even get schematics of your boards. Oftentimes, the data and information you'll get from manufacturers is kind of just a, a block diagram or maybe a little bit more detail about what chips are what and how they're connected. To actually get a complete schematic right, with all the electrical connections and all the parts numbered um, is pretty rare. Um, and when you go and double check things, it's very likely that they're not going to match. Why is this? right? We have engineering change orders, updates, and revisions that pretty much guarantee that by the time your board gets shipped to you, something has changed from that original schematic. Right? Oftentimes, the original schematics never get updated. But what you need to look at is the schematic plus the stack of 13 engineering change orders to figure out what chips are what, where they are, what values they are, and whether or not they're populated or not. Very often, you'll have a bank of resistors, small little uh, uh, components that are used as switches to tell you whether things are configured on or off. And depending on how you want to configure this specific board, because this board is, is one we charged an extra $5 for a feature for, we just pop a little resistor in the right spot, and we enable that feature. So you really can't count on just a slight difference between your, your bill of materials and your board to be an indication that, that something is malicious from the hardware implant perspective. Here's another great one. Um, there was a follow-up article about uh, Ethernet issues um, and how there were some backdoored Ethernet jacks. Do, your, do, you the, do you have metal housings on your Ethernet jacks? <gasps> yes, you do. 
this article implied that that meant you had a hardware implant because they were used for uh, heat uh, diffusion. That's not at all true. Nearly every Ethernet jack today has a metal housing, so why they are listing this as an indicator of compromise is kind of baffling, right? The reason why they have that metal housing is to shield uh, the noise that might come from the, the transformation, uh, the transformer inside of there. So, what's the point? What do these implants do? So, there is very little description in the article about like what the actual indications of something happening was. So. Um, we still don't know. We don't know what network activity might have happened that led to their discovery. We don't know where they were contacting, what they were doing. So we have a lot of assumptions. We have a lot of like doom and gloom, but we don't have any information. So what's the point, right? Why would someone go to all this effort to put these little devices on a board? I mean, is this component graffiti? Graffiti is someone just showing off and claiming their turf by throwing a strange component on a board? It's not necessarily the, the, a, a surprise that this would be possible um, without something else going on. So the problem right now, we have no useful information to help with detection uh, since two months ago, right? Nothing has come up, no details. Um, so we also need to be very careful. Should we really trust anyone who says they do? Um, because if they do, they probably have some more information, and uh, it'd be great to have that information. But uh, otherwise, I think it's kind of uh, uh, a good indication of someone just trying to take, uh, take advantage of the opportunity, uh, an ambulance chaser, snake oil salesman, whatever you would like to call them. So is this real, or is it a hoax? Um, I don't know. Right? I will say that very blatantly. I don't know. I don't have enough information. I am no expert uh, beyond my own research. Um, however, the question that I can answer, is this possible, right? Yes, I absolutely think that the things that were described are technically possible. I'm a technical person. When I see challenges, I see an opportunity to go and implement something. Since this was published, less than a month after it was published, um, Kudaleski Security did a blog post where they had uh, this little device that went and um, reprogrammed over the, the I2C interface a network adapter and showed that you could basically send undetected network traffic over I2C. I2C is a low-speed serial interface. Right? In this example, they have a USB-connected device. This is uh, the Hydra bus. Um, there's no reason this couldn't be implemented in the microcontroller, and there's no reason microcontrollers can't be implemented in the size, not necessarily the size of a uh, grain of rice, but not much larger, and in a package that would be really uh, obvious to find on a motherboard. Um, NCC Group did a great article uh, discussing uh, hardware implants and supply chain issues. Um, in addition, uh, if you're headed to uh, CCC later this month, uh, Tremel Hudson's going to have a great uh, presentation where he has his uh, proof of concept. He's going to examine the design of a spy bus hardware implant with similar capabilities of those described in the Bloomberg Supermicro article. Um, these are, uh, you know, these mod chips uh, of the state. So again, we're going back to these mod chips from game consoles uh, is kind of where, where the, the old art has come from, and really that's what we're doing any, uh, anymore. We're, we're, we're modifying an existing system with some, some new useful features. So again, is this possible? Yes. But that's not the question we need to ask, right? That tells us what's going to happen in the near future, but um, Swift on Security, who is clearly a very great authority, um, talks to US government hackers on their experience and asks the question, how did Bloomberg find the only Chinese supply chain hacking story that wasn't true? So I'm up here telling you that it seems improbable to me. I'm not saying that it's improbable that there is supply chain hacking going on. I would have to guarantee there's ha supply chain hacking going on. But I'm questioning the details of the story and how we should probably re be properly reacting to this. So why would they use a coupler? The device that was described as this little white chip that has no place on a motherboard. It, it belongs on a network ad uh, Wi-Fi adapter or a Bluetooth module or a cell phone. It doesn't belong on a motherboard. Um, why are there no first-hand accounts? And if there were even second or third-hand accounts of it existing, how come there was no reports of what it actually did? Uh, what was the actual end cause? Did it, did it exfiltrate data? Did it steal data? Did it manipulate data? Did it blow things up and catch servers on fire? We don't know. So the A in many APTs is often missing, the advanced part, right? Is it realistic for us to assume that the first HAP, the first hardware APT, would be an advanced one, so finely polished and tuned that it's a custom chip that was designed in a custom package that was you know, sneaked, snuck into uh, a specific set of boards for a specific uh, vendor? 
That's a bit of a stretch for me. So uh, Joe Grant had the greatest quote in the article, which specifically said, having a well-done nation-state level hardware implant uh, surface would be like witnessing a rainbow, uh, rainbow jumping over, a unicorn jumping over a rainbow, right? This is the type of stuff where if they're actually doing it to this degree, you're not going to find it. And if you are going to find it, it's not going to be done to this level of, uh, of perfection. So I want to believe, right? From a technical perspective, this is so exciting to me, and I'm looking forward to the next few months where people start proving that all the technical details are possible, but I can't put any faith behind the story. And afterwards, if you come talk to me, I have a bunch of stickers of this, so ask me for one of those. So you may say I'm a dreamer, I'm not the only one, because you will need to expect, I know of at least four groups of people who are working on proofs of concept. You will see them at CCC, Black Hat, DEF CON, upcoming issues of POC or GTFO. So keep your ears out, keep your eyes out uh, for more details on the technical side of this. How is this possible? How can we make it work? But how did we get here, right? This is still a little bit hazy, right? Uh, earlier this year, we had Spectre and Meltdown. They really changed the landscape, in my perception, of how we treat hardware, right? This was a hardware vulnerability, but it was software exploitable, right? That was the big difference. And this was the first time we had a really like, solid response to a hardware vulnerability. There's been hardware vulnerabilities in the past, and there are sometimes BIOS updates and other, other mechanisms. But Spectre Meltdown had this coordinated response from nearly every operating system vendor at the same time, across multiple CPU vendors at the same time, all in response to a hardware architectural vulnerability. This is different from how we've treated hardware vulnerabilities in the past. Side channels between uh, 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 caches and uh, you know, multi-threaded multi processors have been known for over a decade, but only now is it a big deal. So why do people trust their hardware? Because they don't know that they shouldn't. They've never had the experience to think that this piece of hardware is actually mutable, it's modifiable, it's manipulatable to the same way that our layers of software are. So the next question is, would anybody listen if we didn't have this choreographed disclosure, this song and dance website, logo, theme, and all that stuff? Um, would anybody pay attention to these hardware issues? Uh, I don't think so. But now that I have your attention because other people have done this, let's talk about the right things to do. So a measured response means not like reacting, not doing a knee-jerk reaction, like actually having a logical and well-thought-out approach and response to something that's happened, right? So let's say you go to the doctor. You just read in the news that someone died from cancer. Some person of, I don't know who it would be. And uh, you go and you say to the doctor, hey, let's, let's start chemotherapy. Or, wait, 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 what's going on? It's like, well, I want to start chemotherapy. So-and-so died of cancer, and I, I hear that this is how to fix it. Well, why don't we you know, do a physical checkup, see if there's anything wrong with you. It's like, oh, no, 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 I, I, I just, I, I know this is going to fix something, so let's just do it. It's like, well, you know, chemotherapy has a lot of side effects. We don't even know if you have anything that might be cancer. We don't know whether it's malignant or, or treatable or untreatable. Like, you know, well, then what can I do? What can I do uh, to protect myself? And the doctor would probably say something like, well, you know, eat lots of vegetables, exercise regularly, and stay healthy. Uh, but no one, no one puts a lot of effort into that, right? They want solution. Um, I don't think anybody actually wants chemotherapy. This is a, obviously an a, a exaggerated example. But this is the response that people are having to this kind of news, right? You can't find something that's not real. We don't know whether this implant exists or not. Um, you can look for it. You can spend lots of time looking for it and lots of money. But that's only going to distract you from the actual risks you need to worry about, right? Think of a hardware implant as a complement. Uh, at the opening note, Jeff Moss mentioned that at the executive summit, he heard like C-level executives bragging to each other about who got which apps like uh, attacking them, which, which nations were attacking their companies, which is a sign of how important you are. If you've got a hardware implant in your system, that is a complement, right? However, if you're not already defending against APTs on a regular basis and doing a good job of it, then you're not ready to worry about hardware APTs. Entirely different league, okay? And so an effective attack actually does something, right? Can you detect malicious software or ne malicious network activity? Um, what I took away from the, the Ant catalog, which came out, which was leaked in 2013, is we had all these examples of hardware implants. I'm a hardware person, and I think about how everything can be done in hardware. But the hardware implants in the Ant catalog basically were hardware devices that gave software access. As soon as the software took control, it was a software solution from that point on. 
So if you've got the infrastructure to monitor your network, monitor your software, then you're going to detect something when a hardware device goes and levels up to that level of privilege. Right? That's how the hardware is going to do it. So what should we worry about, right? So you know, what, what are the big threats we've got today? We've got botnets with DDoSs and mining uh, on people's computers. We've got data breaches. We've got ransomware and, and crypto ransomware and all different variations thereof, right? All this happens from money and disruption, right? Uh, and a few other scenarios, too. But uh, hardware, it has a couple specific things that are unique. Hardware lets you bridge air gaps. So is there a way to make money or cause disruption by bridging an air gap? That's when hardware might pop up, right? Hardware lets you persist wipes. You can erase the entire system, and somewhere in the hardware, whether it's firmware or actual like silicon or other additional modification, you can persist that wipe that happened on the, on the uh, persist the wipe that happened to that system, reinstallation of the operating system, even reflashing of the BIOS, right? This is a scenario where hardware might be a rock, an actual threat, right? Hardware lets you show off your capabilities, right? This is that, that corner case, that scenario, like, hey, if we wanted to just show off that we can make this chip that is very tiny and does things, then, yeah, it's an opportunity to show off, but uh, it still doesn't make sense to go to that level of, uh, of detail and, and a custom-designed chip and a custom package to just show off that you can do it. So a typical server will, will have about 10 or so components that have their own firmware, right? This is in addition, this is not including the drives or anything else. This is the, the, the BIOS, the flash chip, you know, the, the hard drive controller, the network controller. All these devices have a little bit of firmware on them, right? In addition, it's going to have hundreds of active components. These are components, and whether they're doing, excuse me, power regulation or logic or anything else, they are going to be, be active. They're going to actually do, do things, uh, just switch, switch current, switch signals, or switch data. Right? On top of that, you're going to have thousands, if not thousands, of passive components. These are these tiny little grain of rice size resistors that are just buffering power, that are, that are uh, regulating power throughout the system. So you've got a huge surface to look at if you think you really need to look down to the level of finding grains of rice that are actually secret active components. Um, this is an image from a presentation I gave. I gave at Black Hat USA two years ago, the, the Dow of Hardware, the Tay of Implants. And this is a stack of hardware implants that I built. And aside from the one on the far right, they all cost uh, a few dollars. The one on the far right was like 100 US dollars. Um, the point is, like, these are pretty hodgepodge, wired together things. These are hobbyist level. But these are just as much a threat as these uh, grains of rice that we have not been able to see. So is it makes more sense to look for something that we can't see or look for something that we can. So what can we do about it, right? Ripping up the servers is probably much a waste of time, right? Do you have hardware acceptance criteria? When you order 1,000 servers or 10,000 or a million servers from a supplier, do you actually do uh, any review of it? Do you actually have any requirements about what that supplier does and where they acquire them? Even as minor as saying, oh, please don't buy gray market parts. Um, that's a big step that many companies don't even bother or know to take. Did you look inside these systems before accepting them? You know, it, doesn't, it takes a lot of work to find something the size of a grain of rice, but if you open up a box and find there's extra cards in slots in your boxes, that's a huge sign that most people aren't taking the time to even look, right? Where did your hardware come from, right? Are you sure it actually came from there, right? How do you audit this, right? Do you audit that the hardware you accept is actually the hardware or you ordered? And did you order, uh, do you audit that the hardware you order from a certain source actually came from that source? Um, these are important questions that are going to go a lot farther and actually being a rational response to the realization that uh, supply chain uh, vulnerability uh, is, is a threat to you. Right? Have you ever had this discussion about supply chain security with your vendors? If you haven't yet, don't waste your time tearing servers apart. Spend your time building uh, understanding with your vendors uh, understanding of what your requirements for hardware security are, and uh, collaborating to make sure that your future systems at least have uh, a realm of verifiability to them, um, whereas the existing ones perhaps do not. So do you consider a $5 hardware attack in your threat model? Uh, the previous example was that were those gas station skimmers, right? $5 of hardware stuck into an exposed port on a gas station pump gets someone value, right? 
does your threat model consider 100 euro uh, attacks, right? If you have not yet done both of these, please do not waste your time uh, with threat modeling for $1 million attacks, because you have to realize that what's going to uh, be the problem is, is the thing that's more likely, right? Would you notice a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino stuck inside one of your systems? These are big you know, development boards. These are off-the-shelf parts. If you don't have a mechanism for identifying something like this, then again, you're not making the right uses of your priorities when you're looking for re and reacting to reports of other supply chain issues. So why even start looking? So what's the impact of an attack, right? Uh, a lot of the reporting that happened in the past two months pointed out that Basically, if you have a hardware implant, it's game over, right? And the issue is how common is that attack, right? Because our actual risk is a combination of the impact of the attack and the frequency of the attack. And so when we deal with um, more common software issues, the impact is a lot lower, but the frequency is so much higher. So we need to actually consider the risk when we rate what's important and what's not. So what? Um, in summary, right? Hardware attacks are a real threat. Um, I've talked about this many times for the past several years, so if you want after the fact, please let me know. I can refer you to other sources um, that'll give you details about what is possible from a hardware perspective. Um, but you really need to remember you need to respond to the threat and not respond to the hype. And that is what I've got for you today. Thank you. We have time for a question or any questions? Oh, there's one. So, got a mic coming. Thank you. Um, I'm not a hardware expert, not even on like hardware implants, anything, but. Um, to me, the grain of salt that or rice that you're showing that you know Bloomberg is showing really looks like a resistor or something like that, right? Uh -huh. Has anyone actually uh, been able to like take high resolution pictures of those images and take a look and compare it to like existing pictures of resistors or diodes or something similar, you know, shaped packages and say, "Oh, I've seen this before." So there, there's a very well understood procedure for doing something like that. I don't know if that has been done or not. That's part of the fact that like even people who've said that they've seen these things haven't ever followed up on like how they uh, observe them, uh, analyze them or anything. Um, so if I had one of those devices, you know, I would go through a process of, you know, basically a uh, nitric acid to, to find the silicon inside or x-raying it to find out the structures inside to see whether or not it's just a resistor or it actually is an active device. Um, but again, this specific device, I don't know, I don't know anything. Uh, we'll, we'll see, I think, very soon some examples of people uh, putting together chips in a larger package that is indiscernible from the naked eye. Um, but would very easily be identified from an X-ray or something else. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you um, think that it's possible for someone to build this kind of device, would it be easier to uh, directly inject in one of the big chips uh, some uh, VHDL that is already malicious? Uh, it's the same person that are uh, building them. So I'm not sure I heard all of it. You're asking if it's easy to put like logic VHDL into an existing chip yes. versus uh, modifying another one. Yeah. So the story described like a multi-pronged supply chain issue where they, they modified the motherboard, they modified the build materials, they modified the components, right? The thing is, any one of those things should have been sufficient to get the job done. Like the only reason they would do all of them is if they were really like intent on blowing money, which is apparently not odd for government agencies to do. But... Um, you know, when you ask that, the question you're asking is, it, would it be easier just to go and implant it at the silicon level? And, you know, an example, the A-Speed BMC, right? Uh, they're all sourced from China. They're all uh, pretty much designed in the same place. So, yeah, it might actually be easier to go and infiltrate the design of a CPU like that just because it's harder to detect and uh, it's all in one place. So I'm not saying it is. Uh, it's totally possible, though. Yeah? Oh. Hi, 
What's your take on the Huawei discussions that are going on with New Zealand banning the use and the US banning and the UK allowing? I mean, it, and a Huawei D-slam is a bit larger than a grain of rice, but nevertheless, is, is it a real threat? Or? Um, so my, my sort of tongue-in-cheek cynical reaction to that, so a couple of years ago, uh, the US government like asked, uh, said Huawei could, Huawei could not be used in any like government and was not recommended elsewhere in the U.S. Um, you know, basically they were pointing out that like they can't guarantee that it's free from Chinese government interference, right? Um, it's interesting because we see evidence that like every government's doing the same thing, right? Um, different countries maybe have like different legal systems and different rules for that, um, and maybe are more likely to, dis to disappear people than others. Um, to make stuff like that happen, but um, I don't I don't see how that was any more a statement about those companies than it was about you know U.S. companies or European companies or you know uh, Japanese companies or Chinese companies. So yeah, <laughs> my my cynical response, but that's time. Um, I've got stickers, and I'll be around here or in the hall if you want to ask any more questions. So thank you very much.